big brother, governments. We got big mother, all these machines that are telling you what to do. We got uh, little brother, corporations that are collecting all this information about you. And we got this one that I call uh, baby brother, which is that we're all willfully giving away all this stuff on social networks. Um, isn't there a danger that we'll sort of create this trail of digital crumbs and a mirror image of ourselves out there that can be used uh, against us? So how can we, on the one hand, have all the wonderful benefits of urban intelligence, uh, but on the other, still you know, safeguard our right to privacy, which is a basic human right. It's the foundation of a free society. Well, I think that that's the fundamental tension that we see in smart cities. And I think that it goes back to what I was saying, that you need to have the option to opt in. And my suspicion is that we'll always opt in because we tend to like uh, convenience and we tend to like security, but I think that we should have that option and we need activist groups. So we need every city to have these technologists that are civic activists and they come together and they educate through the internet and through public meetings and explain to people and push the government for transparency. That, that's the only way. Can you can it. clearly see in terms of regulatory culture the differences between Europe and the United States in this regard because uh, you know, in the United States you've had um, you know, any number of steps that have been taken by telecommunications companies and others in cooperation with the U.S. government to provide data without people necessarily knowing it. In Europe, there's a huge thing. Just think about do not fly lists in the United States, passenger data, things like this. Every time something like that comes up in the U.S., it's staunchly resisted in Europe, where people are very educated and aware about their rights to privacy, even though those are countries that have national ID cards and things like this. So very different political... And, uh, and constitutional cultures really do play a role in this. Yeah. Okay, well, and that strikes me as really important uh, then for all of us, too, because if, if it is so attractive that we all opt in, we're going to be giving away all this data. So don't we need sort of a, a culture and a, and a regulatory environment that ensures that that information is used for the purposes for which it was collected, not There's used maybe other... one or two interesting yeah. examples that are ten, not, not entirely tangential to this, but of people realizing that, hey, if we're giving away all this data, we should be selling it and profiting from it. So there's a couple of startups out there that are saying, let's do have sort of this like a class action suit but without the lawsuit. It's saying, let's get together as large groups of, of people who's, who fit a certain demographic profile that is very desirable uh, to companies. And let's make sure that we're not going to have this data accessible until it's bought from us. So these sort of digital collectives are forming uh, in, in the US and, and maybe elsewhere. And it's a good example of how to make the most of the situation. <laughs> Okay, well, we can talk more about that one if you want. Um, so you talked about the nation state, and you threw out a real interesting kind of one-liner there, but um, under the agrarian age, we had city-states, and then it was with the Industrial Revolution, we had the creation of nation-states, but now we have all these smart cities on the one hand, and we have a global economy on the other. Is there actually a disintermediation that could take place here where nation-states could become less important or even irrelevant? Well, you know, I, I tend to not take it as an all-or-nothing proposition. There are some states that remain strong and getting stronger, like China, you know, like Brazil. And then there's many states that are fragmenting. If you look across the Middle East or, quite frankly, the entire post-colonial world, which is half the world's countries, really. So there isn't one universal answer to the future of the state. What I tend to think of is that there's going to be this layering, right? You have countries, yes, we all accept that countries are a, a, a pillar or a foundation of world order. But now you also have cities. And many of those cities act like states unto themselves. They conduct their own diplomacy, their own trade relations on a constant basis. I'm seeing and encountering city diplomats all over the world. And then you have the companies. They represent themselves as well. Free agents relocating, setting up uh, their new headquarters all over the world, evading taxes, all of these kinds of things. And then communities. Right? Cloud identities, cloud communities, uh, uh, ways of belonging to people and sharing resources in ways that also transcend borders. So uh, rather than say either or about the state, I think there's countries, cities, companies, and communities. Okay, so you raise this really interesting idea of you have greenfield situations like Sondo and so on. And then you have brownfield. I guess Toronto is a brownfield. But um, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a good thought that, um, you know, that we... That, existing cities, we have this little detail called the legacy, right? And God, you know, may have created the world in six days, but he didn't have an installed base uh, to deal with. So, um, Aisha, how do... Well, well, 
how does this happen in a brownfield situation? Toronto's made some great progress. We've got these great things like Evergreen. You know, sort of collectively, how can we move forward to a more intelligent urban environment? I think um, you were... You're doing it right with the Toronto waterfront. You kind of have to do it incrementally, and they're known as rejuvenation or regeneration products, projects. London is doing it as well. If you start with one part of the city, you begin to experiment uh, with the technologies over there, and then you begin to move it slowly, incrementally across the rest of the city. So that's when you're talking about large-scale network infrastructure. What San Francisco is doing is then it's using mobiles as the other network that we all have. So there is physical infrastructure that takes time, and then there's the information layer, and we already are, each one of us is a sensor in that sense, because we're carrying around that mobile phone. So if you could leverage that as an infrastructure, then immediately you can add services on top of it. It's very hard to ignore the weight of inertia of legacy systems if you think about sewers and subways and things like this in a place like New York, or why is it that Amtrak, the US railway, takes as much time to go from New York to Boston as it does to go from New York to Washington, even though New York to Boston is half the distance. Well, it's because of the old rail lines in Connecticut. Can only, you can only travel on a certain speed, even though you've built the, the fastest train that America has to offer. So it is an enormous weight, an enormous burden, which um, you know, ideally many countries are able to just leapfrog because they never had those legacies. Well, another example that you mentioned is the power grid. I mean, if Alexander Graham Bell came back today and looked at the phone network, he wouldn't recognize a damn thing. You know, where are all these things? They don't have wires. They have pictures on them. And everything. But if, if Thomas Edison came back and looked at the power grid in Toronto, he'd say, cool. Uh, you know, that's my power grid. I mean, we have this big, dumb, industrial age power grid with centralized production, pushing stuff out, sort of like broadcast, mass production, mass distribution, mass media, and so on. So, I mean, it, it seems like such an overwhelming thing to, to change that. What's happening on this question of power? Well, let me just, I'll say one thing, and then um, Aisha can as well. The, one of the key things is uh, the sources of power, because it's not just traditional fossil fuels or coal. So the, the part of building a new smart grid is also being able to draw on power from totally different kinds of resources, like renewables, solar in particular. The investments in solar and wind are absolutely remarkable in many parts of the world, uh, from China to the Middle East, Europe, and elsewhere. Even non-sunny parts of the world are doing this. And uh, one of the largest, the single the largest solar project on Earth is in the southwestern United States, uh, which is going to generate a tremendous amount of power as well. But retrofitting a grid or creating a new grid to harness that is one of the key investments that needs to be made to, to strengthen uh, energy and power infrastructure. I and the fact is that you just have to bite the bullet and you have to make those investments. And I think that Portugal is doing it right. Portugal decided we need to do it. And they created a separate municipal agency, and they're doing whatever they can to streamline investments coming into the country um, so that they can build the infrastructure. It's so odd where leadership comes from. I mean, here, here's Portugal, a country with a sovereign debt crisis. Portugal's probably the most lead, advanced country in the world in reinventing the schools. Every right. kid has a laptop connected to a high-speed network, and they've changed the whole model of pedagogy in the schools. I mean, it's astonishing. This is where the European subsidies went all this time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, at least they spent it well, unlike that's other true. places. Just, just a couple more quick ones. The city is software. I mean, that sounds a little creepy. But, <laughs> but on the other hand, I mean, what is software? Software is just this stuff that sort of encodes what, what we want as, as human beings. Could you, I mean, you threw that one out. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little more on that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It, it encodes information about people. And it is able to give you um, in services that are tailored to you. So the, the ideal smart city is one in which you, you walk through it and it seems like it's dynamically changing. And that's the idea of the soft architecture of the city. Where, um, you know, and we saw this in Minority Report, where as you're passing by, the billboards are kind of inundating you with, with personalized advertisements for beer. Uh, there's, a, there's a company called Immersive Labs in New York. And they're building the minority report billboards. And essentially what happens is, as you approach it, again like the vending machine, it recognizes your gender and your age, and it changes. So if I went, it knows what I've been searching on the web, maybe it connects with Amazon, and so it gives me advertisements that I like, and I'll do something else for you, Don. And so it is scary in the sense that it knows so much about you, but its city is software because the soft architecture of the city is constantly being uh, shaped to meet your particular needs. 
One more, um, the, uh, the smart home. Uh, so there's actually a guy in Toronto, a, a friend of mine, uh, and his name is Ken Nickerson. Everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address, which means all these things are connected to the internet and they all talk to each other. I have no idea what his toaster says to his refrigerator, <laughs> but he was bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler. And I said, well, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about my own home and wondering, if you have teenagers, this is great. You'll have a system administrator. But what happens when your teenagers move out? So how, how are we going to manage all this stuff? Well, I think this is the, a great opportunity. I call smart cities and the Internet of Things, as it's called, because they're connecting things. The next big bubble that will happen after the Facebook bubble pops next year after it IPOs. And this is a huge opportunity for developers and for designers. Like, everybody should be thinking about human uh, machine interfaces. Like, how do you design an interface that's easy to use and yet has such depth of uh, service available to you? How do you design these apps? It's a huge economic opportunity, which is why you see these companies run into it. But these things have to be designed to be simple and intuitive for citizens. Fundamentally, though, by the way, you know, it's not just an arms race of creating the coolest gizmos for the home, but there are, there are genuine aspirations for efficiency here and energy saving and so forth that are extremely important. So it isn't just about the sort of whiz-bang and so on. But the, well, this is why don't you important. just wrap up on that, and then we'll go to the audience. Like, what's, what's the bottom line here? What's the benefit? of doing all this to us as citizens. Can you summarize that? You know, these two great trends that we mentioned at the beginning, urbanization and technology, absolutely have to come together. They're not going to run in parallel, right? And I think this is not something that has to be forced. This is very natural because people are moving to cities. Cities have always been the locus of innovation, of testing technology. What we need is to turn it into something a bit more of a rigorous discipline, which is what we're trying to contribute to here because these are two inexorable trends, but it has to be systematized in such a way that we're, that we're getting this right because we are, in the, in the broadest sense, you know, in, in the sort of age of environmental crisis and political crisis, uh, resource scarcity and so on, and bringing these two trends together right is going to be a huge part of the answer. It's going to improve your quality of life, for sure. I mean, especially when dealing with the government. Uh, when you're spending hours on the phone trying to deal with them, things will happen automatically. They'll be all connected. You'll save time. Uh, you'll be living with less pollution. But at the same time, you'll have to deal with giving away a lot of your personal information. Comments, yes. Quick question. Could you just I'm say who you are? Oh, and... sorry. I'm Chris Fraser from Google. Um, love the hybrid concept, and Don, you mentioned it, but as Margaret Atwood says, what happens when the power goes out? How smart is the city? Does that hybrid concept have redundancy? You know, when Fukushima, when the tsunami hit, the engineers hadn't factored in that it was going to be hit by a, by a big wave, so the, the, you know, the infrastructure to keep the coolers on was at ground level, and it wiped it out. So it's great to be smart in projecting forward in terms of the future. But we need power to, to be part of the future. So are, are, are we focusing on a, a redundant, non-power reality also that allows us to live without this ever-present touch of technology? I mean, we should be. And that's a very good question. And it's not only the fact, well, redundancy, first of all, is built if, if you work with technological systems. But I think the bigger question is cyber attacks. We've even seen Amazon, which hosts all the major companies that went down. Sony had a cyber attack on them. Uh, Sony actually did not want to make some of its software open. And so a bunch of like thousands of hackers attacked it and bought it down. I think that's a very, very big risk. Um, and uh, terrorist attacks are also very big risk. And, when, um, and all these cities are actually trying to put in those fallback mechanisms, and this is a constant race. So in terms of having uh, cheap and low-tech options, I think the mobile phone is going to be very important in that, and I think we'll see that in slums, a lot of innovation coming out of that. Um, but I think it's a very good question. We've just got a wired city, and in this city we're, we're fueled by Pickering and Darlington. Yeah. So if those go to anarchy that basically develops, because I, I don't know what life is like in Fukushima right now, but my gut tells me that it's not smart. No, it's, it's very sad. And you're absolutely right. I think these are questions that people are thinking about. Business continuity, as it's called. And 
uh, how do you make systems continue or life continue? And uh, it's an excellent question. A number of us will have to have fallback options. The government is responsible for putting those uh, options in place. <laughs> well, if I can comment too, I mean, that's an argument to move towards a smart city in, in the sense that we need an intelligent power grid that's not centralized and based on, on, on a dumb uh, production modus operandi of power. And has storage to obviously. Absolutely. Storage, absolutely. Storage so if we have a distributed network, there's a guy in Toronto who generates all the power for his house, and he's a net contributor to uh, the power network, and he's documenting everything that he's doing online right now. So if we have a power grid that looks more like the internet, we can avoid, avoid that problem. That's not an argument against a smart city, it's an argument for it. So that's why I was saying that, that exactly as Don said, it's distributed so that the only threat that's really scary is a cyber threat. We have a question over here. Uh, yeah. Rob Klein with City Toronto. It's really a follow up to the previous uh, question. Um, you know, you talk about a smart grid and the fact that we're putting in solar and it's making it more resilient, but we're not. Okay? A smart grid okay, still talks about centralization because when you're dealing with affordable fix and problems, the power grid goes down. Nuclear power plant, the pickering goes down. Everyone's solar system shuts down as well. And they can't provide power to the old house. So we're not building resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my question is, you know, you call it a smart city. I would call it more of a techno city. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really becoming very dependent on technology. And I really question whether we're going to be resilient considering, you know, the type of world we're going to be facing in 50 years. If all the projections, you know, with the scientists because we're not doing what we should be doing. So in 50 years, the world will look much different. So are the people that are looking at, you know, not technical cities, but bio cities, how can a city be self-resilient and self-healing? So if there is a major disaster, okay, you're not relying on someone outside of you. Uh, you know, a smart city you know, would build in New Orleans. Okay? New Orleans would you know, change. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at Construction and agriculture, just take those two areas. That's where you see trends towards the desire to have or promote a local kind of resilience, right? So vertical farming or making sure that food is, is grown around and close to cities as possible so it's less susceptible to those supply chain disruptions is one example. Uh, smart building, so, you know, lighter, stronger types of materials, uh, you know, and, and making sure that one builds with that, you know, avoiding maybe there's a skyscraper that sort of opens every five minutes in the world today, but that doesn't mean that that is a very smart thing to do, right? So looking at new materials that are more uh, resilient and, and low cost and so forth. So I think industry by industry, sector by sector, we can try to mitigate some of the risks that you're obviously very, very rightly pointing to, but it's not a blanket universal answer. I think you have to think about the various functions, like how do we build, how do we feed ourselves and so forth, and make sure that you're building in resilience that way. But is anyone in the world looking at you know, going the opposite of a technical city? Are you looking at you know, how do we build a bio city? Well, the, I mean, I haven't come across a major city that's doing that, but there are obviously little uh, groups of people who are doing that. In Bali, there's a school that was uh, that is open, which is all about little children living in these tree houses and using the agriculture they grow themselves and learning everything and living in the hostels, which are completely natural, no electricity, no nothing. Um, and yes, that that's one way to build in that resiliency, but again, they, there's no city-wide approach to doing that. Um, Technology can promote a bio-city approach, if you think about biofuels, biomass, in terms of biopower, in, in, again, in Stockholm, in one of the original smart districts of Stockholm, they do uh, bio, they've been doing biomass power for a long time, incinerating bio waste to generate energy and things like this, so a recycling of the bio sort of essence is, is uh, can, can be enhanced by technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be an antithesis. Yes? Um, I'm just thinking about where we are at Evergreen, and um, one of the goals is to educate people and to reconnect them with nature. And I think that most people would agree that's um, a goal of, or a essential for sustainable, for real sustainability. And I just wondered if you thought of that as an additional risk, is technology disconnecting people. I mean, if you don't have to worry about turning off your hair, your hair dryer or um, worrying about how much water you use, people are, are less educated and teams less smart about um, real sustainability. Yeah, I, I think that I that there could be a danger of that, but in fact, I think it opens up people's time to do other things, to get together and actually think of ways to save the planet instead of just focusing on 
on you know using your, your fridge at different times. And I think that's what I meant when I said that um, a smart city is just is not automatically a great city. A smart city is just one step on the way to a great city. And the way that you make a great city is to create an ecosystem of people who are activists and entrepreneurs and um, also people who believe in culture and arts and use all that to get people together. And so it's supposed to facilitate that kind of conversation. And you really free up time to do that. But also, again, it doesn't have to be an either-or situation. I think you, know, you the way you phrase it, it gives the impression that um, you don't need to worry about how long you let the water run. It, that's the exact opposite of what's going to happen. It's all in the pricing. We don't pay the right amount for our fuel and our water today, right? For our power and our water. None of these things are priced right in, in almost the entire world. Uh, you know, water should be the most expensive commodity there is, right? Not fuel. Um, in these smart cities, you actually are paying based on how much you use, and so people are going to, you know, sort of be conditioned or incentivized uh, to do their laundry at certain times to be very careful about how much water they use because you're actually paying for what you use, which is not currently the case. And also, you're constantly seeing how much you're using, so there are dashboards that are giving you updates, and research has shown that if you show people in real quantitative terms, what they're actually consuming and the impact that it's having on the city, then uh, then people are more careful. So right ours, now we're just blind to it. A friend of ours at, at Stanford is developing in his lab this sort of whole augmented reality sort of home where as you walk around over the course of the day and you do things, it, there's like a little cloud that emerges behind you that you can see in mirrors. Yeah. It's a digital cloud that pops up like, like a th thought bubble and it tells you how much you know, sort of emissions you have uh, consumed or wasted on disturbing. that day. And look, we know that it may seem silly, but this is the only way in which people learn, is through seeing and, and being shown what they're doing and through shame. That, that's it. And, and those are the two forces that are being combined, and it's technology that's doing that. We need to learn also, um, uh, be incentivized to change our behaviors. We have Ron Dembo here from Zero Footprint. Could, could you just tell us for a second sort of what you're into on the question of incentives here? Um, you know, just to, to put it in context, I think uh, this discussion, which I love, I mean, I love hearing about technology and I love technology. It's kind of like debating lawn sprinklers when you don't have plumbing. In other words, there's very basic stuff that's not here today that could be here without any new technology. And that is uh, the kind of stuff that makes the financial markets work. To give you an example, there are thousands of buildings around us, 2,000 apartments in which 1 million people in Toronto live. They're in terrible condition. We need to retrofit them with big energy hubs. But the financial markets are not lending to those. It's a huge business. I mean, it's many billions of dollars. Why? Because they don't even know how. They don't even know how to compare one building against another. Mm -hmm. Those simple things that we could do are not being done. So I would, I would say that, especially given that most of the infrastructure in cities like this will still be there for a long time, we need to also contemplate the simple things, like, for example, ratings. How do you rate buildings so financial institutions can actually invest in them? <coughs> we don't do that today. So I, I, I would, this kind of reminds me of looking at a popular mechanics, 1930s popular mechanics view of what the year 2000 would look like, and you'd laugh at it. And I bet you people will laugh at our view of what the you know, 2070 would look like. It's kind of, we can push that and it's fun and I love it, but why don't we do some of the more basic things that actually will fund this? And that's the challenge we have. How do you bring the capital markets in now? So I think it's so important to do it. I think you're absolutely right, but I think that citizens need to understand that in a highly competitive, globalized world, um, having making these infrastructures, having these financial markets coming and invest and pushing the government to do it is critically important. Because while we're sitting here with our old legacy infrastructures, the emerging markets are heavily investing in new cities where they can leapfrog and don't have any of these issues. You know, there are, I know people in the, in the United States military, the Defense Department, who've teamed up with people in, in my own uh, think tank in Washington to come up with a grand strategy of energy sustainability that looks at, at forcing capital markets to invest in the single most toxic area of the American economy, real estate. Right? How do you take this absolute crazy mess of a housing bubble that America has had, boarded up houses now with you know, mortgages underwater, invest in making them into green homes? 
right? And that is going to promote American grand strategic energy independence from the Middle East, right? So there, there are people out there thinking about exactly the kind of bricks and mortar uh, solution that, that needs capital markets and government support in the way that you have uh, just suggested. But it's a nation thought, but it is, it is out there. Okay, well, we're going to have... Yeah, uh, we've got another person here first. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think that some of the things that we're um, really buying into uh, is the collaborative consumption trend that we're seeing. And I think, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Airbnb, which is very popular now, where um, you can actually um, rent out a room in your home, and uh, it's, it's valued at over a billion dollars now. And there are new startups in Silicon Valley where you can actually share cars. It's a zip car model, except you don't have cars, but... Uh, let's say I came in, Parag and I come into the city, and then we see Don's car is just, the wonderful car is just sitting in his parking lot, and then we just go and use that, and, and we pay for the floor and then return it. So this idea of sharing things as much as you can is very important, and not just uh, collecting um, objects and materials which can be shared, including um, a, another trend that's happening is that people are starting to get together, especially in the U.S., I'm sure it happens here, and grow on farmland. Uh, and go and grow organic vegetables and things. So I think we, we try to do that as much as possible. Alex. Yeah. <clears throat> Alex, at the University of Toronto, there is one area that we tend to neglect, and Aisha and Farag, I'm glad you brought it up. And thank you, by the way, for such a wonderful session. Happiness, joy. How about wise cities? Mm -hmm. A city that enables me to pursue joy with no regret, that allows us to eliminate unnecessary suffering, and we have a lot of that with the way in which we have degenerated our work styles, our families, our education systems, and so forth, and a city that enables us to cope with uh, unavoidable suffering. Uh, how about that, and Aisha, could you please comment on that, especially with opportunities like uh, Living Planet or what we have in Toronto, where we have over 150 different ethnocultural <coughs> communities still living in harmony, we are not killing each other. We may have tremendous opportunities to do something truly unique here, retrofitting joy. I think that's, that's incredibly important, Alex, and you and I have been talking about this for some time. Um, how can urban intelligence help us lead a healthier, happier life? And one of the things I talked about was that it, it saves time, and that time can be spent with your family. But otherwise, also, it can give us information. So for instance, um, something that I'm working on at the moment uh, is um, a health avatar, which can tell you that uh, these are this is the map of the city. You're here. Why don't you actually uh, walk from this point A to point B, and it actually maps out the route for you. Uh, that's the kind of thing which is very helpful and when you're trying to look after your health. Or when you go into a restaurant, uh, automatically it tells you what the best things to eat are given your particular health profile. <laughs> or it is automatically um, telling you the kind of um, sustainability efforts that you can make in your apartment. So by constantly motivating you and guiding you to make the right decisions, to have positive behavioral change, I think it can allow us to lead fuller and happier lives. Um, that it's the potential is there. Now, whether we do it like that or not, that's always the problem with technology. It's always a double-edged sword. But we do have the data. We have the analytics. We can crunch it. Google and Amazon and Facebook are already doing it, and they're making lots of money. So um, there are ways with people like Alex that we can actually use this information to build the kind of applications that let us lead better lives. Okay, let's take one, one more here, and then we can break into informal discussion, because I know a number of people have to get on the freeway and go to work. Hi, I'm Alice Gavin, with Green Girl Consulting, and uh, thank you very much, it's been very informative. On the value of sort of a, a happy city, I'm just curious how you would speak to conservation um, from all the conferences that you go to, because if you look at the human within the urban setting as the driver for adaptation to technology for the smart cities, Conservation is kind of, you know, a base simple um, 
action that needs to take, whether it's retrofitting your home and getting an energy audit, because if you save money with decreasing your energy use, you also have potentially a happy person that has a little more money in their pocket to spend it somewhere else. So it could just be non conservation. So I mean, think in, in cities, because they will remind people that even if you do live in one of these sleek, smart, uh, hopefully wise uh, buildings or, you know, or cities, you will still have this connection to, to resources. So I think you know, consumption taxes, consumption pricing is going to be a very important part of the answer to that. And so that there is a sense, you know, in that the map of the city needs to maybe include a map of the resource inflows into that city. Where are you actually getting your, uh, your, your vital uh, sort of your nutrients and, and, and resources from that, that power a place. I think that too will help to sort of stimulate people to understand the, the chain uh, of resources and supply chains and, and that I think also will promote conservation. But even, I mean, as we spoke earlier, the, the price of energy and water just isn't realistic. So we as North Americans, I mean, Canada is one of the largest energy consumers in the world. And uh, we're going to continue to have blackouts if people don't continue to try to change their consumption patterns. Well, would you like to wrap up? A couple of final thoughts from each of you. Well, you know, I mean, uh, as I said uh, in response to, to your question earlier, there's this, this very important confluence of these two trends. It's not going anywhere, right? We're seeing the, the consumption pattern in terms of resources, urbanization increase, and then also, of course, the, the, um, the persistence or the ubiquity of technology become more and more micro and more and more widespread. So for us, the, there's really a search for this model. A lot of the questions seem to have you know, been around, I think it's not surprising. Um, you know, what about the individual as a political animal, right? I mean, how are we shaped conditions? How do we do the, the shaping uh, in these environments? And that's part of what that unfinished Urban Bill of Rights is really about. Uh, you know, it should also be a bill of responsibilities. And a lot of people say, outside of the technology sphere, Forget the Bill of Rights. What's the? What are the new individual responsibilities that everyone should have? So, you know, it, that's that's a starting point for a different conversation um, about citizen engagement, citizen responsibilities, and there's this balance that Aisha indicated that needs to be found between saying citizens go forth and, and run your own lives versus you know we are a, a smart thinking forward looking government that uh, is anticipating some of these scenarios and i think you know let's face it even if the technology starts to become similar and spread we still have lots of different cultures lots of different initial conditions and so forth so you're going to see uh, still a, a tremendous amount of experimentation in all of these areas we are uh, as you were saying uh, sir earlier you know we're we're at the we're really at, at uh, the very, very beginning of this exercise, and we rightly shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. I, should. I would, I would just urge everyone not to think of smart cities only as high tech and high cost, but to think about the fact that if five billion people are going to live in cities by 2030, two billion of them are going to live in slums. And I think we really should be conscious of the fact that cheap and low tech, especially using mobiles, can transform their lives. And it should always be at the back of our mind when we talk about intelligent urbanization is to, to really step back and look at the whole world together. Let me end with an editorial comment because I agree. Um, this is a time of great peril and danger in the world, but it's fundamentally a time of great opportunity. And I don't, with respect, think the choice is between some kind of techno city and a more human or bio future. The choice that we have is, on one hand, we have the status quo. Um, which is not sustainable and uh, which will destroy humanity if we continue to behave the way that we're behaving. I mean, Bill Clinton was saying at Davos, if we reduce carbon by 80% in the year 2050, not by 6%, by 80%, it'll still take a thousand years for the planet to cool down. In the meantime, some bad things are going to happen, like a billion and a half people are going to lose half of their water supply in the next 10 to 20 years. You know, we have this internal combustion engine automobile that's destroying our planet. We have this massive urbanization. The only way we're going to be able to deal with this is to reinvent the city. And we have this huge power of information technology and networks to be able to do that. And sure, we're all worried about the future, but my view is that the future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And we can achieve a wonderful future if we get engaged. And if we bring our values and our expectations 
uh, to the to the table, then this new intelligent city in this age of network intelligence will, will be one of promise uh, fulfilled. So that's kind of uh, to me. I mean, it's it's uh, wonderful that uh, Evergreen has hosted this event. That we've had these extraordinary people here today, and I think that it's kind of a call to each of us to get involved. I mean, we have this great city, and we can participate in its reinvention, which it surely must go through. So thank you very much for. Uh,